This is Duke University. In today's talk, I'm going to demonstrate how young uh, people involved in the underground rap scene both showcase the inability of the Puerto Rican state to provide adequate opportunities and resources for youth on the island, and the ways that these young people resisted the state's attempts to use policing as a solution to social crisis. Manoduda explicitly targeted low-income urban areas in response to a spike in violent crimes associated with the island's burgeoning informal drug economy. As a central component of Mano Dura Contra Crimen, police officers and uh, National Guard soldiers were deployed to raid and occupy public housing complexes and low-income barrios under the auspices of uh, rescuing residents from drug and gang-related violence. Puerto Rican rap is a mu musical expression of the failures of U.S. colonial colonialism and development, highlighting the difficult realities of circular migration and the implementation of a neoliberal economic agenda on the island, especially as it was experienced by the island's young people. Indeed, economic constriction, migration, diaspora, the expansion of the island's informal economy and the enclosure of public space were as crucial to the development of underground rap as the increased accessibility of technology, such as four-track recorders, turntables, mixers, and drum machines. As with U.S. rap, public housing and low-income neighborhoods formed a key ter uh, territory of Puerto Rican rap and its imaginary. Many of the genre's early artists came from some of the island's poorest communities. Uh, marginalized from the, far, uh, the formal excuse me, uh, labor market, Puerto Rican youth engaged with rap music not only way, as a way to pass time or as a vehicle for fen uh, venting frustrations, but also importantly as a possible source of economic support. Forced into idleness and underproductivity, Puerto Rican youth in the diaspora and on the island turned to rap music as a way to put their talents to, to use, or at the very least to kill the excess time with ha what comes with, that comes with not having to punch a clock, right? Not having to go into work every day. Um, simultaneously, the informal drug economy grew on the island, and like the development of rap music, took advantage of an excess of young people, particularly young men, who found themselves marginalized from the formal uh, labor market, right? The material and structural forces that led to the rise of um, drugs and rap as parallel paths towards economic and social mobility tell us much about the terrain of possibility for young people in post-industrial urban context in the United States as well as in Puerto Rico. The intimacy of, rap, of the rap scene and the drug economy on the island manifested itself in the lyrical content of many early rap songs, which discuss the reality of the punto or the drug point um, and both the opportunities and destruction that it caused in many low-income areas. In particular, many artists recorded cautionary tales that touched upon the violence generated by the drug trade. The shift in lyrical content, I, I argue, in many ways mirrors an intensification of state repress repression at the tail end of Governor Rafael Hernandez Colon's uh, administration from 1988 to 1992, and then also the implementation of Mano de Contra Crimen in 1993 under Governor Pedro Rosselló. So, so songs like Pal Cruce and the others mentioned uh, above, you know, they question the legality and efficacy of police intervention, and they give voice to a growing frustration with police abuse and harassment among young men from working class uh, in low-income areas. So despite the clear kind of critiques of police impunity that are embedded in many of these underground records, the sheer amount of lyrics dedicated to going th to the punto to cop drugs, smoke weed, um, enable critics and police officers to use these records to demonstrate the imbrication of rap music with the informal drug economy and claim that the genre did little more than serve as a recruitment tool for drug dealers looking for a new clientele. So dealers not only finance recordings, but they also um, would pay for parties that the artists would perform at for public housing residents as a way of currying favor with residents there. Um, and 
you know, the history of, of this kind of practice has become very hot, hotly contested, right? Um, with lots of folks denying it, saying that it, it, it's kind of used to smear, uh, uh, as a smear campaign against the genre, right? But, you know, I think that we can actually benefit from mining these real and imagined imbrications of underground with the drug economy, right? In order to understand how underground rap become so easily folded into these logics of mano de contra crime and this kind of zero tolerance-esque uh, policing measure, right, that's also occurring at the same time. In the fight against underground, police start to employ similar tactics of race and class-based surveillance and spatial containment in their efforts to curtail the, the genre, the very same kinds of efforts that had been central to um, Mano de Contra Crime and, 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 its, and its kind of war on drugs and public housing. So these new measures end up taking advantage of the dispersed nature of underground's distribution circuits in order to justify a kind of widespread monitoring of youth who fit the so-called rapero stereotype, right? So this is the kind of language that, that's circulating, right? So in essence, what was happening is that there was a, an informal justification for the uh, profiling of poor and working class racialized youth. Um, so while Underground ignited a culture war of sorts on the island and then the popular media during the, the mid-1990s, the misconception about rap music and calls for its eradication uh, took up an even greater kind of amount of, of, of public attention, right? So in their defense, um, they, they, they link it to these interventions in urban space and their failure. So supporters pointed out how the government was using underground as a kind of scapegoat in order to explain the sudden spike of, of violence um, and crime that the first part and the, and the mid-1990s witnessed, right? So supporters of underground saw the attacks on the genre as essentially a political shell game. So as the government maintained that it was effectively combating crime, through Manadura, they, these politicians accused underground of undermining and complicating their successful efforts, right, by pr promoting deviance, drug use, and violence among Puerto Rican youth. Indeed, raperos and fans alike provided nuanced analysis of the situation, pointing out that the focus on underground as a catalyst for crime, drug use, and violence on the island obscured the failure of the state in providing security and financial stability to all of its citizens which actually lay at the root of the growing sense of um, anxiety and precarity that many Puerto Ricans were experiencing. Additionally, the attempt to cast raperos and by extension youth involved in the informal economy as delinquents hell-bent on terrorizing the hardworking people of Puerto Rico obscured the ways in which many young, uh, many low-income youth have been rendered redundant by colonial capitalism. The policing of underground as part of a larger, as part of the larger Manuela initiative criminalized youth not only for their economic decisions but for, and, in the context of dwindling um, opportunities, but also for having the gall to openly discuss this reality through their lyrics. The celebrations of smoking weed, hanging out, trying to get laid and trying to get paid that structured the genre's lyrical content rendered visible a reality of idleness and informality that was in fact experienced by many youth on the island. So, you know, hopefully with this talk, what I've tried to do is, is work to contextualize and historicize the ways in which um, rappers and drug dealers were conflated as key perpetrators of violence and crime on the island. Um, I've analyzed this assumption not only in an effort to debunk the real relation, uh, not, excuse me, not in an effort to debunk the real relationships that existed uh, between the informal drug economy and rap music, um, but rather to emphasize the way in which such relationships have served as a justification for the policing of marginalized youth on the island. The policing of underground rap, like the raids in public housing, relied upon and reified racialized and class notions of crime, poverty, and spatial ordering that led to further stigmatization, surveillance, and harm for young people. Uh, particularly for young uh, uh, black and brown youth from low-income um, areas who came to embody the threat of violence during the Manadura uh, era. So lastly, I've also tried to show um, that, you know, this did not happen kind of passively, right? That the youth themselves who were active in this scene, um, you know, critiqued this poli these policing efforts um, as an attempt um, on the part of the state to appear to be doing something, right? When obviously these efforts were we're kind of not producing the desired results, right? Violence was still increasing. Many youth were still kind of 
for style the formal economy, right? But they, they kind of critiqued it uh, in this way, right? And, and drew attention to the failures of the state um, to address the precarity uh, being experienced by Puerto Ricans on the island, particularly Puerto Rican youth. So I'll end here.